Jim, our next question sent on Twitter using the hashtag corny drive through is from Grant Cameron. Would making Ivan Koloff the territory traveling NWA champion worked? Or have worked, I guess it should have been said. And hello, Grant, by the way. Um, I, you know, he was a fantastic worker. His promos weren't the greatest in the world, but the, he had the Russian accent down. And in the 70s, that was especially, that was hot. So he didn't fit the, he was more gimmicky than most of the NWA champions until Flair, who was flamboyant and et cetera. Uh, but at the same time, Ivan's work was every bit as good as you know, uh, the highest level guys. So the fact that he was a Russian heel and could come in and defend against the area's baby faces would have worked. But in those days, the NWA champion also had to be matched up against a lot of the area heels. And I don't know whether they would have wanted to do that or not, because a Russian coming in would trump just their regular normal American heel. What do you think, Brian? It's interesting. I mean, Ivan Koloff, think about where he could have gone as the NWA champion. Could have gone to Mid-Atlantic. Would that have worked? Yeah, well, because it, it did later. Ivan was on top in the Mid-Atlantic territory when he was in his middle 40s. That's right. And 50. So he certainly could have hung there 10 years earlier. Ivan Koloff going into Georgia, feuding with the likes of... As NWA champion, feuding with the likes of Bob Armstrong or Tommy Rich or yeah, you know various other people. Would that he worked? worked Georgia and worked with a lot of those guys. Worked Florida. Um, I, I I mean, as far as as in the ring and with the opponents that he had on the babyface side, yeah, he definitely could have worked. I don't know. Again, you know, a lot of times Harley was was a baby face in a lot of cases when he was in his home territory, whereas Ivan was, <laughs> they would have had to run Moscow for him to be a baby face in his home territory. How would Lawler versus a champion Ivan Koloff have worked compared to Lawler versus, let's say, Harley race? Actually, probably would have been better because it would have been easier because they would have hated Ivan right off the bat because he was a Russian. And... I, 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 Ivan, for whatever reason, Ivan Koloff came through the Tennessee Territory one week in 1975. Maybe it was two weeks. I don't know. But he only made Louisville once. And he was also, I think, on a card in Memphis. And he was also on a card in a couple of other of Nick's towns in a preliminary match against Norvell Austin in Louisville. And... When I saw the card in the newspaper, I was like, Ivan Koloff versus Norvell Austin? What the fuck? And he was here the once, had a great fucking match, took a huge backdrop, as I recall, from Norvell Austin, and won because it was Ivan Koloff. He wasn't going to come down and do a job in a preliminary, and we never saw him again. I don't, maybe he was on vacation, but he, uh, him and Lawler would have torn the house down in the 70s. He just said something interesting about seeing his name in the newspaper when you went to see the card. What was the process like for you as a kid to find out what the card that week was going to be in Louisville? Well, in Louisville, it might, might have been different than some of the other towns in the territory. In Louisville, the newspaper ad was in the Sunday paper. In the early years, they put it in the Sunday paper and also in Monday and Tuesday, and the matches were Tuesday night. But then later on, I think they... Wanted to save money, but the card was in the Sunday paper for if you missed the TV show on Saturday. And then sometimes when TV got bumped to Sunday, you may have been able to read the paper and see what the card was before you watched the TV show, but it was for the following Tuesday. That was the promotion. Your television show that aired on Saturday gave the card and had promos for the matches, and the TV or the uh, newspaper on Sunday listed the card in the ad in the sports section. And unless they had Bockwinkle coming in in 82 or something really big going on and they'd buy a few TV commercials on Channel 3, that was the extent of the advertising and sometimes radio. But not a lot of times it'd just be the wacky DJs talking about that they were the ring announcers. 
That was the promotion for the card every Tuesday night. The tickets went on sale Monday morning at the Louisville Gardens box office, and they were on sale Monday from 9 to 5 and Tuesday from 9 o'clock until match time. There was no ticket master. There were no uh, satellite ticket outlets. You either got them at the box office at the gardens or you walked up that night. And that's the thing is in the territory days, your advance on a regular house show, a regular town that you ran every week or every two weeks, every month, whatever, regular schedule, your advance would be 25 to 30 percent of your total house. In other words, if you did 10 grand, your advance was three grand. You would triple or quadruple whatever you had at five o'clock on day of the show for an advance sale, you would, your house would end up being three to four times that on spot shows at local high schools or wherever the fuck it was eight to 10 times, whatever your advance was, your house would be eight to 10 times that now. And I found this out in ring of honor 10 or 15 years ago. The advance of a wrestling show now these days is like 90% of the fucking house. And it was, and the tickets were cheaper then. You didn't have any ticket master fee or a service charge or whatever. You just went to the box office at the building and paid $5 for your fucking ticket. I wanted to ask you that. How do you think things would have been different in the territory days for both the promoters and the fans if... You know, as opposed to a Ring of Honor running a rec center or this place or that place, if you're running a regular territory and the big buildings or the semi-big buildings in your town were Ticketmaster buildings and every ticket was going to have all those fees attached to it, how would that have affected the territories and specifically a weekly territory? Probably put them out of business. Huh. Because we had, we had to pay a Ticketmaster fee at the Knoxville Civic Coliseum even back in the 90s. It was whatever it was, like 25% of every or 25 25 cents for every ticket sold just to print the fucking ticket out of the thing or whatever. And a ticket master set up chart, blah, blah, blah. Um, and now with the amount of money that the tickets cost, plus the service charges, the fees, the whole nine yards, it'd be ridiculous. No, you could go to wrestling. If the general admission tickets were $5, that's what you paid to get in five fucking dollars. And here, there was a difference in Memphis now in the, and, and the Louisville pattern that I just laid out. In Memphis, they put the ad for the Monday night matches at the Coliseum in Saturday's paper, and sat, as well as Sunday. Saturday's paper, the early edition, came out on Friday nights. So I figured out that on Friday night, if we were in Tupelo or wherever the spot show was, and I was driving into Memphis for TV the next morning, I could stop at the Shoney's, where I always stopped at the breakfast bar there on Sycamore View. And by the time I finished eating, I could go to the corner of Summer Avenue and Sycamore View. There was a newspaper box and the Saturday morning papers would be out. I could get a paper and read the card to see what I was booked to do. But because that the newspaper ad with the card came out before the TV show on Saturday morning, sometimes it was a dummy card. The main event was false booked because they would do an angle on TV Saturday morning and somebody would get in a fucking hoo-ha and they would call Eddie Marlin out and say, change the card. I'm not going to wrestle so-and-so or I'm not going to defend the title against so-and-so where it's going to be a tag team match or I'm going to wrestle this guy or we're going to add a match or whatever. And they would change the card. That's why some of the newspaper ads for the Memphis cards do not reflect the matches that actually took place because to make it look more legitimate when they changed it on television, they would actually put a phony card or a phony main event in the newspaper ad. And then they would change it on TV. Everybody in town watched the TV show. And then they would know what the fuck was happening. And tickets in Memphis were on sale at the box office at the Coliseum all afternoon on Saturday. I think they may have done something on Sunday also, and then all day on Monday until match time. Again, that's where you got your tickets. And 
the biggest walk up would come between the matches in Memphis start at 7.30. The biggest walk up would come between 7.30 and 8.30 for the people that didn't give a fuck about the whole show, but they wanted to see the main event and what Lawler did. So they'd come in an hour after the matches started, but they'd get the $3 general admission ticket and sit up in the top. And plus that was, they got a chance to go down to the box office and talk to Lawler's mother. Hazel was the woman running the, the selling the tickets in the box office. So that was how everybody got the, that was how the cards were advertised. And that was how everybody got their fucking tickets. And again, the only other advertising in Memphis was Jimmy Hart would get up early and go to the radio on Monday morning and, you know, do that. Otherwise, there was no mass promotion. Everybody watched the TV, and if you missed the TV, you knew to check the paper and see what the lineup was. And this was not something that was unique to the Tennessee Territory. It was that way in almost every territory. The newspaper ad and the TV show, and that was the promotion. The people knew how to get there and knew how to find it. 